welcoming all of you and especially Dr. A.R. Vasavi. I have been uh, fortunate to have met her 25 years ago. Together we had done some uh, classes uh, in, in the Institute of Management code code at that time. They had a module for PGP students on social transformation in India. Around that time, I believe, we met. Eh? And also, she came to Samarin's Guru Ayurvedan College, where I used to work, and gave lectures there. But, you know, the last 25 years have been remarkable in the way she did her, of course, she had prior education was in Delhi School of Economics, Department of Sociology, doing her master's there, and then did her <coughs> doctoral uh, work in the Department of Social Anthropology in the University, Michigan State University, USA. She has worked basically on, at that time, on the agrarian society in Karnataka, especially Northern Karnataka, which was rain starved. And it's a wonderful kind of work, which was later on published in 1999 as a Harbingers of Rain. You know. um, I find uh, uh, that was her um, focus area then as well as even today. Later on she wrote, a, wrote out a book, a very interesting book, Sh Shadow Space, Suicides and the Predicament of Rural India, which also was equally path-breaking. And uh, then she has written other books of which uh, uh, Differentiation and Disjunction, which was published in 2022, which deals with, it interrogates the Indian educational system. So you could see that uh, in between she had also published together with edited volume of uh, on IT <coughs> work and IT workers in India's IT industry. Outpost of the global economy was the title of the volume. And that again is uh, uh, a path-breaking work. Dr. Karel Upadhyaya, another renowned social anthropologist working in uh, Nias, Bangalore, and she together brought this out. And it, is a, it was again, I just remember a few things like, you know, how at that time when they conducted the field work, uh, quite a lot of, uh, most of the IT companies engaged or appointed um, candidates from upper and middle caste, but very few from the lower caste. Along with several other topical issues related to IT world, and uh, then uh, you could also see she has contributed chapters to several volumes. I will just mention one because I have to mention that Crest had brought out and we had conducted earlier. Uh, maybe some of you might have attended our meetings uh, in honor of K.R. Narayanan, the late president of India. And <coughs> so in that volume on Essays for K.R. Narayanan. It was titled Nationhood, Social Justice and Unequal Transformations, which was published by in 2019. And that book you have the chapter on caste indignities and subjected personhoods, which was written by Vasavi, which was later on widely got popular acceptance, including EPW publishing it. Um, and that was a path-breaking work she did on the Dalit <coughs> and Adivasi education, education of the underprivileged and what was happening to it. And one thing uh, I have to mention in this connection is her deep commitment to uh, creating an egalitarian India and the, the way there are so many obstacles in various spheres of life and how her writing reflected her
her deep commitment to an equal society which hopefully would emerge one day in India, I believe. But um, in the very interesting foreword to this book on differentiation and disjunction, which um, um, for which the foreword was written by Professor Satish Deshpande, uh, who was one of the best experts in educational studies, sociology of education in India. And he talks about her, how Vasavi, I will just quote one sentence, is internationally recognized as one of the leading ethnographers of education. So I just don't want to say or anticipate anything of what she is going to speak on caste. Um, though, I must say, it was her work which guided our center, you know, um, crest to do our programs to benefit the socially disadvantaged communities in Kerala. And she was very much there when in 2022, I'm sorry, 2002, Professor H. Kalto, the founding director of IAMK, and Dr. Vasavi, who was an adjunct faculty there, together visualized a center where, you know, um, very intensive, at the same time, productive, effective uh, training programs were introduced for candidates, engineering, and other graduates from. Dalit communities and Adivasi communities, and we have been successful in placing them in various positions. So, I uh, do not want to prolong, <laughs> except to say that uh, she is uh, here with us. It is a blessing that you know Serena Trust has the privilege of uh, um, hosting her and she is going to address us right away on a very interesting topic um, which uh, you are going to listen to. But I uh, thank her for all the trouble she has taken to come here. Despite her busy schedule, she was very much with the popular movements in Bangalore. She is one of the organizers and brains behind that. Recently, there was a movement uh, which culminated in the celebration of uh, Rani Chennamma, the two, 200 years before she was uh, perhaps the first person who fought against the British colonialism, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, in India. So you know, people have forgotten about that, no, no. So I think a large number of people got interested in it, especially women. And there was a very interesting uh, coming together of uh, these people in uh, Dharwar. She just comes from there and joins us here. And uh, I am thankful to her. And I am thankful to each one of you for coming here and be with the Serena Trust. And uh, Serena Trust, I have to mention about Dr. Serena, who left us recently. She was, um, you know, I have met him with her a few times. I have been very much impressed by her scholarship, her uh, uh, very uh, value-based and uh, positions she took in academic as well as non-academic issues. And above all, she was an artist in her own way. And Escape at a Card Center stands as eternal evidence to her artistic uh, <coughs> products. So uh, with this, uh, welcoming all of you and thanking Professor P.P. P. Sudhagaran to, who in, interested with me in this, jo this work uh, of uh, being with you at, at this time and giving you a brief address. And uh, thank you very much. And I invite Professor Vasavi to deliver her lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Didi, very much for that very generous uh, introduction. I was telling him in the morning that of all the institutions we can celebrate in India, the institution of friendship is key. 
Uh, with that, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Sudhakaran for organizing this meet, and thank you all for being here, despite uh, Sunday you could have spent otherwise. I'm very grateful that I have this opportunity to commemorate the memory of uh, Professor Sudhakaran's wife, uh, and uh, who was both a historian, a painter, and a translator, I hear. So, although I have not met Zarina, I just feel that in organizing meets like this, uh, the presence of those uh, who have been key to our lives uh, continues, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, share with you a very broad outline. There won't be much detail, but just to flag the extent to which caste has an institution, caste has a worldview, caste has a way of life, and, and of identity is being reproduced in India despite the fact that many people assume, especially in the metropolitan areas, that caste is something of the past and uh, globalizing, fast changing in India, caste does not have a place. Uh, not only to debunk this, but to look at the extent to which caste mentality con continues to constitute much of our personal lives and our public lives. I look at the ways in which, by what I call entrenchment uh, is, is uh, that is forms of product, reproduction of caste is taking place, but also the ways in which multiple forms of resentment against attempts to erode caste or to defy caste norms has led to multiple forms of violence, both again in the public sphere and in the private sphere. Uh, I'll also conclude by making some comments on the implications of this entrenchment and the implications of this extant forms of violence that we see in our country. Uh, so before I come to the actual ways in which uh, we identify the ways in which caste is entrenched, I want to just very broadly flag what are the main structural features or the structural characteristics uh, which mark uh, contemporary India, uh, especially the ways in which institutions, identities, class positions, caste positions are being reworked and new kinds of orders along with caste has a foundational institute are being reproduced. The first form which we need to recognize is the structural entrenchment is that caste has a system, especially linked with hereditary occupation, may be delinked. But as M. N. Srinivas himself was to explain, uh, caste is being reproduced, has not only a culture, caste groups are being positioned as ethnic groups with particular kinds of rights, rules of exogamy, marriage, food habits, etc., but also has a mentality and has something that defines interpersonal dynamics uh, uh, very significantly and intergroup dynamics and also interclass dynamics which where caste and class coincide significantly. So in this case, the principles of caste which are hierarchy based on hereditary, uh, not occupations but hereditary identity here, rules of separation that the high and the low should not mix, rules of purity and pollution, and constant uh, kind of assigning of roles and responsibilities and assigning of positioning uh, are also being played out in many ways. We see this across India despite this overt ways of modernity, education, move to urbanization, etc. being played out to the extent to which caste groups are actually intensifying identities across the spectrum from upper castes who are now re reinvoking their rituals to consolidate the identity, to celebrate it. We see this with the transnational diaspora who are coming back to celebrate caste festivals, etc. And new kinds of rituals are being reinforced. To the lower castes who are also now forming, even sub-castes, sub-jatis are now looking at ancestors, heroes, uh, writing up histories, identifying with, uh, with caste leaders, and registration of caste groups has not only voter banks, but has interest groups and therefore has consolidating the membership of certain sub-castes. So what we are seeing is very much aligned with what Ambedkar described as graded inequality, where he said it was not just the Varna system of just three upper castes, then the Shudras and then the untouchables being outside of it, but each caste group has multiple jatis in which each one tries to include itself with that they consider higher and exclude itself from those that they consider lower. So that is what is being played out across India and it is 
consolidated and expressed most particularly through forms of Sanskrit Sanskritization, which Professor Srinivas had described so well. So we see that even today among some of the most what I call subordinated castes where these Brahminical rituals were not popular. You see Satyanarayan and Ratas being formed, where well, subordinated caste group which had, uh, did not have dowry, in fact had the opposite bridegroom price are now shifting to dowry practices, prohibiting widow, remarriage, etc. All of which are the practices of the uh, Brahmins particularly and therefore this culture of Brahmanism is, is, is spreading even to the subordinate caste. So in, it is in this context also where we then see the, what is the role, what, what role has the state played in terms of caste. Many people think uh, until now the constitutional obligation of the state was to er er erode caste, of, of course with Ambedkar having played such a major role that rules of reservations which in, in politics, in educational institutions, etc. was to, was to disband caste itself and to question this hierarchy. But what we see is that the state has a very complex position vis-a-vis -vis economics and the politics of which it governs the nation. In economics, what we see is, an, what I have uh, highlighted elsewhere, has an economics of neglect in which there has been no serious attempt to redistribute resources and assets which could challenge the fact that subordinate castes have literally very little resources or zero resources in most cases. That accounts for the fact that apart from Kerala, a little bit of Manipur and in the north and West Bengal, of course, land reforms have not been a significant part of our national agenda. In most cases in rural India, land access continues to be held in the hands of what are called the dominant caste, not necessarily ritually upper caste, but those who had access to land, to numbers, numerically strong, and to, of course, assets and to political power later. So it means also that allocations of, and as all studies are showing either to health, to education, to social sector services, etc., towards subordinate castes have been far more in, uh, far more inadequate compared to the numbers that they have. In contrast to that, where there is a politics of neglect, you have given the link to electoral politics where a vote bank kicks in very significantly, is the politics of rescue, where populist programs claim to provide for subordinate caste groups, for subordinate uh, working classes, for example, the public distribution system, free grains, rice, etc., reservation policies, uh, some sort of benefits through scholarships, uh, etc., all of which really are inadequate to make, to compensate for the lack of resources, or to, co or to provide them a, a sufficient base to leave lives of dignity. So it is in this extremes of economics of neglect and a politics of rescue, which we see that subordinate castes have to constantly nego negotiate this uh, sharp deprivation in terms of economy, but only a largely political role, uh, especially only during elections. In that context, linked to the major public institutions we have, all data, all the studies show that legal apparatus, the media, uh, the corporate sectors, educational institutions do not have adequate representation of subordinate castes. And therefore, most of these institutions are exclusive castes. As recent studies have shown, something like up to 70 to 80 percent of key positions in India, not only the corporate sector, but even in the government, uh, continue to be occupied by upper caste. And despite reservation, it is a very, very small proportion of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes who are there. Let us just take, for example, just education has a sector and the set of educational institute. In all descriptions in international literature, even in India, education was meant to be the leveler that all groups, not just caste groups, anyone who has had generational disadvantage, that would be addressed by the opportunity to be educated and therefore to have pro formal employment, etc. But in India, unlike most parts of the world, we have a highly differentiated education system. Or oh, as Didi described in my work uh, across India, I have traced that there are something like nine different types of school boards, 12 different types of schools that exist and operate in India. These range from very poorly funded ashrama schools where allocations to the average scheduled 
tribe or the Adivasi student is calculated as minimum as eight to nine rupees per day for food. Can you imagine feeding a child with that little money? So you can imagine the quality that is there and the quality of teachers would be there. To the extremes of international schools, which with the average uh, annual fees of eight to 10 lakhs per year for per child is higher than what an average panchayat or village panchayats uh, caters to about 250 children or so. So you can see a highly iniquitous, very differentiated and which I later described as very disjunctive educational system has been put into place and the most recent national education policy absolutely overlooks this differentiation, although they celebrate it as making opportunities possible, which is primarily through internet by making mass education possible, overlooks the fact that education is and should be a very deeply interpersonal endeavor, a transaction in which learning takes place primarily through multiple forms of engagement. So it is in this context we see that a differentiated schooling system also feeds into a highly differentiated higher education system where education is primarily now, including universities, are now primarily private, exorbitant, are market-based, and therefore out, outside of the reach of many of the disadvantaged caste groups. So if this, these are some of the ma macro-structural trends that are impacting the nation, you also have other trends which is, again, a culture of consumerism which is linked to a booming market, where it is primarily an urban-led globalizing economy, uh, which has facilitated not only media-based promotion of consumerism, but a wide variety of goods that are available. And therefore, consumerism has become a form of modernity. All groups, even the disadvantaged groups, see consumerism, the way it changes in dressing, eating, living, how, construction of houses, uses of mobile, automobiles, etc., has not only forms of modernity, but has signs of their own upward social, upward mobility. And therefore, competitive consumerism is one of the ways in which we see groups interacting not only with each other, but defining their own identities. With all this, it, it is in the rural areas, encapsulating all these trends is a great and disembedding rural economy. Since the past two decades, especially since 2000, where you see the onset of the neoliberal economy, although it was declared only in 1991, the full manifestation has taken place only since 2000, where you have the state privileging much more the urban industrial economy, the global transnational economies, rather than the rural and agrarian economies. As a result of which we have seen dominant caste groups using this to out themselves, coming out into the urban areas, using their both caste position and their numbers and political access to become entrepreneurs, the biggest investors, all the malls, the constructions you see, the service economy, etc., is now actually dominated by the uh, dominant caste, either the Vokligas and Lingayats in Karnataka, Command Redis, for example, Command Redis has very major construction uh, groups and companies across the country, not just in Andhra and Telangana, but the Rajputs, the Yadavs, etc., also has dominant caste in, in North India. They have now risen not only out of the village into the state players, but the regional satraps, the literally with lots of power in them, who mobilize their vote banks, etc., for both the state elections and national elections are primarily led by the, do, do, by the dominant caste. In contrast to them are the other backward classes, which is a huge, the most heterogeneous and the largest proportion of caste groups, uh, who are outing from being service caste, from barbers to, you know, clothes, tailoring, you name all the other, smithies, etc., who are now through education becoming into these service, semi-professional areas but who with the mandal kind of reservation that has enabled are now into partially educated but very largely into the urban service economy. But there, it is the youth from the other backward classes who form the largest pool of unemployed, semi-unemployed and disaffected youth. And we will see the extent to which right from may, all the major rights we've had, both intercaste and communal rights, it is primarily youth from these networks who have been mobilized by other agencies who become the key agents of both violence and of, of, of boundary maintenance, asking people to retain their caste identities, etc. Finally, we have the subordinate or the laboring caste seen as SCs, STs, etc., 
who have actually benefited to over the two past decades it will very simplistic studies say this continuous degradation etc which is actually not true increase in real wages has meant that there has been an improvement in their purchasing power in their standards of living they are living better lives earlier at least in terms of material goods uh, etc there is some amount of mobility in among them which is done primarily through reservations in fact they the scheduled castes have done better than the obcs in, in many ways into entering uh, uh, professional sites and visibility in, in some of the reserved political constituencies which is also the basis of deep resentment by the obcs who feel that these people who are lower than them are actually doing better in this new kind of india that and the fact uh, uh, that there is a small elite a small visible elite has has emerged does not mean that they are then able to take the community with them as anand teltumde has many of you know incarcerated under the uapa um, in prison who has written so eloquently about caste uh, thing has shown that how these elites coming from the scs have actually been domesticated and co-opted into the dominant agenda and are really many of them are not representatives even if elected of the community so this has been a, a very big problem finally i want to say that when much of this restructuring that has taken place means that it is a resignification of the key symbols and identities of caste Uh, what we see across villages documented very well by anthropological studies is that earlier villages festivals would be uh, the village has nadu ur festival which multiple castes would come together and celebrate a single deity a uh, someone who was assigned a role of protecting the land and the village and the people but more and more because of the reinforcement of sub jati identities which are registered networks and especially the youth now are active in it there is a disengagement from village festivals and rituals and a subscription to national uh, trends for example in karnataka we see how sabrimala has become very important and most recently with the uh, ram janmabhoomi movement uh, subscription to ram as i entities we've seen syncretic rituals of villages where muslim deities of not deities has sites dargahs mosques were important in uh, catholic christian shrines were important in fact the village god would propitiate these and then a village festival would be uh, celebrated we are seeing separations taking place very sharply and therefore each jati or caste or each religious group having their own village festival so this is very uh, in, important as to the extent to which uh, there is a contradiction there is a submission to the national homogenizing a trend of hindutva one god one text to those tenets etc and at the same time a subscription to a sub jati level shift away from a more inclusive rural identity the same is also happening in the urban areas where a large but very visible and powerful class both the middle class and above especially those who are in uh, say industries such as the it bt and the new service economies especially very sophisticated which are back end support designing entrepreneurship etc et there is a vacuum in the sense of belonging uh who are we what are we especially when they face western uh, not only audience but players and uh, or western uh, em- employers in which in that seeking that identity they are resorting to both the you know a, a constructed identities of what hinduism is as hindutva is explicated by hindutva uh, imagining that these are superior imagining that it bounds them together etc we saw this very visibly in from the third week of january when the ram uh, janmabhoomi ayodhya temple was to be consecrated where across the cities in complexes in houses in in clubs and associations uh, upper class people got together and started celebrating ram and ram has has a child ram lalla etc people who were not even vaishnavites were not think you, where they had backgrounds of either being shaivites or even jains for example Uh, we saw all submitting to the celebration and suddenly a new founding of ram has the deity for them so what we are seeing is the kind of vacuum in belonging that is happening to groups that have been transposed transshifted from rural areas to urban areas and urban classes who are then exposed to the global orders and are seeking to uh, new identities that can give them a sense of superiority 
So it is these processes and trends where, where there is, we see not only an entrenchment of caste, has a guiding force, an identity, has network, and has a life world, uh, which also accounts for the ways in which caste has not singular, but sub-caste identities, multiple, and, therefore, and then a subscription to Hindutva is, is also taking place. But within this context, we also see a lot of resentment especially at aberrations where they have examples of people defying caste positioning where you see SCs or STs moving up the social ladder with opportunities or there is a slippage from caste absolutism where there is challenges to dominance etc. It is in this conditions that I will identify at least four to five types of violence that is occurring because of the caste resent or resentment against class slippage or erosions that are taking place. These violences are away seen first at the interpersonal level, which we see across India and documented very significantly. Uh, one is which is uh, where in, in cases uh, where low caste, low rank caste, subordinate caste defy ca dominant caste or upper caste norms and rules, uh, and therefore in, invite wrath against themselves. In in north especially, which is. Uh, what what for us would seem just absolutely you know uh, innocent or, or or trivial reasons uh, uh, young young boys celebrating a wedding for example a low caste person coming for his his wedding riding a horse that would in, invite the wrath of the upper caste people who would say no you you are not entitled to do this etc so boundary maintenance has has has, has very significant we also have the case of social boycotts that are being organized at interpersonal levels where families or households which have had inter inter caste inter jati marriages are then asked by the caste panchayat or the caste uh, you know the leaders of the caste uh, to be boycotted. We've had this case in, in the area where I live and work, Chamranagra, where a backward class community which has a very strong jajman or a yajmana system which is like the Kaap Panchayats of Haryana, they call for social boycotts uh, against any household if a boy or a girl from their caste groups and OBC caste group marries someone below them which is primarily the untouchables, SCs or the STs. But if they marry higher up, up they don't call for a social boycott. Uh, this is something we've taken up quite seriously and more recently we're trying to see how a social legislation can be passed in Karnataka against all social boycotts which could be sometimes where they excommunicate the whole family from the village, ask them not to come back or the couple that has married is not allowed to enter the village. There is a legislation against this, it's called anti-social boycott only in Maharashtra and we are also trying to implement, get this implemented in Karnataka. So social boycott has a major way in which violence is perpetrated against those who try to defy caste norms and regulations. Along with this, as many of you have read, is honor killing, another extreme example where couples who defy this are actually killed. And we see this violence, what was reported is only tip of the iceberg. It is much, much more rampant. Many people first thought it was restricted to the North, North India, but we're seeing this documented in Andhra and Telangana, very significantly in Tamil Nadu, where it's happening in, in, in Madras, in Chennai itself, large numbers of uh, these honor killings have taken place. And in Karnataka, we have documented it significantly. You also have the case in Gujarat, where you had Una, where uh, upper caste boys actually whipped publicly the uh, scheduled caste boys for, for what they thought was transgression of being rude, etc. Finally, all these acts, interpersonal acts of le legitimized humiliation has the process in which low rank caste, subordinate caste have to be kept in their place and a process of dehumanization which is legitimized. And uh, this is very, very explicit in the cases of both rapes of individual girls and women and gang rapes in which it is the assertion of caste-based power. So what we have seen across the spectrum in India is that is the weaponization of, of uh, rape which is abetted not only by the fact that there is very little evidence, very little state-based action against the culprits, and the fact that they, there is a culture of impunity, both the society condones them, we saw this, although it is in the case of Bilkis Banu, but even if it had been an intercaste issue, there is actually a celebration when uh, perpetrators come out, when the system itself does not uphold the uh, uh, 
uh, rules of order or a rule of law in those cases. So legitimizing inter uh, uh, personal violence then also means that the caste norms at each level get reinforced and there is an entrenchment. This is also explicit at the village and community level, again both seen at the infringement of caste power and privilege. I mentioned how institutionally, economically, uh, there has been no redistribution of resources. In fact, it has been consolidated in the past decade. If you see many states where agriculture and land uh, rules are a state subject, Many case states have removed ceiling limits to land ownership, etc. Karnataka did it. Earlier, Tamil Nadu had uh, done it. Uh, earlier, there was a ceiling as how much anyone land anyone could use. Right now, that ceiling has been removed. You can own any amount of land. There are huge speculators, investors coming and amassing large parcels of land, uh, etc. It's in that case where small landholders, especially from scheduled caste uh, groups, have been threatened. And across the spectrum of, uh, in India, we have uh, cases where uh, land disputes are manifested in absolute, you know, killing of families or setting, um, you know, uh, setting fire to whole bastis or to whole areas where disadvantaged caste lives. Kairlanji, again, documented by Teltumde was an extreme case of where in Maharashtra, a family that had had a long-standing dispute with uh, upper caste, uh, dominant caste groups, uh, faced ter terrible violence because they had refused uh, to let go of their land which the dominant caste wanted, where the mother and the daughter were not only publicly raped but were brutalized, the son was killed and only the f uh, two sons were killed and only the father lived to tell the uh, story and later it took a long time, huge machinery had to be put in place to get the uh, uh, police to register it. So again, it was not only Kairlanji in thing, but you have Kamlapalli in Karnataka, you have it in many, many Tamil Nadu villages where there are long histories of contestations of over land which are not resolved by the state have become the basis for a, both village level uh, violence. Uh, with this, we have the extent to which at the level of institutions, I mentioned the important role that education should have played, but actually it has also become a site of reproduction of caste. Uh, educational institutions continue to be sites of great humiliation, uh, which instead of education or educational institutions endowing what they call equality of opportunities, uh, a sense of self-recognition and identity, uh, and, and of great dignity uh, for, for participants or, or, or to the members, you have cases where again there is a lot of uh, reporting of humiliation and forms of exclusion that are deployed against them. Uh, Rohit Vemula's case from the Hyderabad University which documented long years in which the uh, you know, the scheduled caste, the, uh, the disadvantaged students' union was marginalized, the way they were harassed, they were not allowed to study, not allowed to take exams, etc. More recently, you have Solanki's case in IIT Mumbai, where a boy committed suicide. But these, again, are only tip of the iceberg, and as other data show, that the percentage of students, SEs and STs, who come through, through a reservation into these institutions, their percentage of graduation, of access, and also entry into so-called, you know, rewarding jobs is very, very limited. In some cases, it is less than 30 uh, percent, etc. So a very big uh, and important international study that compares what are called protective discrimination in the U.S., which is primarily for African Americans, in South Africa, for again, for Africans, and in Malaysia and India, shows that in India, Politically, reservations in educational institutions has a lot of currency, but if you see the actual impact, the numbers who graduate, the numbers who actually has, uh, go through a process of upward mobility and get opportunities is very, very small. So as DD flagged, uh, Crest's uh, role and actual contribution was in that context of challenging those forms of discrimination and humiliation and therefore enabling such disadvantaged people to have equality of opportunity. So we are not seeing that at all. It's in this context I'd like to bring your attention to a very important book called How Nations Fail. It's by Asimo Glow and Robinson, who look at many different nations and, and, and uh, highlight what are the multiple reasons they fail. And one of the key things they say, it is not wealth per se at all. It is actually how public institutions function and what do they provide to their average citizens. And in cases where institutions function to be inclusive, endowing, 
and supporter, you would see that that benefit accrues not just to the individual or to the group level, but to the national level itself. So in that, in that context, we see in India that despite having these institutions, for example, recently has election campaigns are uh, uh, gathering momentum, you had they'll say, oh, so many IITs are being set up, so many more IIMs, so many big, big institutions. But the question should be, what are they doing? Are they really contributing to the most disadvantaged and therefore to the national level? So where institutions are not inclusive, integrative and supportive, they then really become, again, sites of disadvantage and do not enable what is called a shared resemblance. For example, equality of opportunity would mean an SC or ST a student is as is, is equally competitive and endowed as an upper caste or, or an upper class student, which we don't see. More recently, even institutions such as IIM, IIMs are being subject to this uh, kind of inbuilt exclusions that they have. Uh, IAMB, which I'm a little familiar with, uh, recently we've had this case where a faculty, upper caste, along with a student who just so happened he was also a, a Brahmin, they reviewed all the number of faculty positions in, 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 uh, uh, in 13 IAMs. They found that instead of the reservation, they, they found that there were many hidden and uh, very kind of conniving ways in which this constitutional obligation of taking SCST faculty was being avoided. They showed that 95% of the IMs of the faculty in IMs were upper caste. Out of 640 faculty in 13 IMs, only four were scheduled caste and one was scheduled tribe. And therefore, it showed the extent to which this form of exclusion, and when they wrote up this, this faculty member served notice. Last week, he was served a gag order, told that you, you, you cannot share you know, information about the way IAMs recruit faculty, et cetera. And there is cu currently a, a major uh, case in the, in the high court where this faculty has uh, questioned the IAM's gag order against him and the ways in which he has actually, he is an award-winning, uh, Deepak Malgan award-winning social scientist and extremely good uh, research that he has done. But he's actually been demoted and he's not allowed to teach not allowed to take classes, et cetera. So this is just an example of the extent to which caste issues are really some of the most uh, divisive, contested issues, but really don't make it to the, uh, what, what we call, to the reputation of these institutions and, and are really hidden agendas. Finally, I want to come to the regional levels where you see caste, uh, uh, caste what I call disassembling of caste and the complex ways in which, in which it is also feeding into communalism. I know many of you would know details of South Canada, the way in which over the past three decades it has become the Hindutva's laboratory for Karnataka and has also had very major national impact. Uh, but it is here that the shifting of caste relations and caste uh, uh, alliances and their own class positioning has actually led to consolidating Hindutva. And I want to use this as an example to say that it is not only Gujarat as a state, but also closer to the south that we have these cases. And the details from this tell us about the ways in which ca caste uh, uh, tensions and violence is being played out. As many of you know, um, South Canada is an extremely heterogeneous area, at least for the past 500 years ago. Uh, you've had migrations of Brahmins coming from, from Goa, from North India first, and then Goa during the Inquisition, the Gautsaraswat Brahmins, uh, the Konkani-speaking groups that came in. Then you've had the Catholics, uh, some converts, uh, Catholicism becoming very significant. But you also had the other landed caste, the Buns, etc., who, who actually had access to large parcels of land and to a very highly commercial, mercantile kind, kind of economy that existed. In the 1974-75, when Karnataka legislated land reform, most of these, what the bunts, etc., land-owning castes actually lost land and it went to the lower rank caste, the work, working uh, caste groups, etc. But it was at the same time this kind of disassembling meant the, the uh, and the 1970s uh, demand for labor and for semi-skilled professionals in the Gulf meant the Muslims of that area and some of these low rank caste groups started going out to the Gulf and came back with a remittance economy and improved their social and economic position. So caste hostility also became communal hostilities where you see 
the Udupi Mutt, very strong, backed by, by uh, Saraswat, by the other Brahmins, and the Gaut Saraswat, um, the, for example, the Chittapur Shashwat Brahmins Mutt, playing a big role, uh, constantly consolidating identities and projecting the, the new Muslim arrived uh, mostly from the Gulf, in which Muslims had also gone through Arabization, in which uh, the, uh, the, the hijab and the burqa were being worn, uh, new kinds of mosques were built, but there was overt, when I talked about the importance of consumerism, where there was overt uh, engagement with consumerism and therefore a lot of hostilities and hostilities between these uh, these groups and and the uh, all the other working caste groups and the Muslims, as a result of which vigilantism, hate culture, uh, defiance of institutions have all record, been recorded. For example, uh, uh, young youth being in pubs, you, you, you'd have all read about how the youth were attacked in pubs by the Bajrang Dal and some of the Sri Ram Sene has an army of defending uh, upper caste Hindu culture being set up there and uh, Mutalik and others promoting it through a, a network of people. Vigilantism not only against what they call bad Western influences, but also vigilantism of, against Hindu Muslim uh, youth dating or or just uh, socializing. A hate culture in which a lot of promotion of literature uh, against not only Muslim but even lower caste was done. And the most recently, since two years, the, the prohibition of hijab in which something close to 600 and odd Muslim girls actually dropped out because when the hijab was banned by the then BJP government, they, they were not allowed to take exams, etc. So you see again forms of exclusion taking place. But it is here in this formation of uh, Hindutva laboratory that you see OBC caste uh, the cl class groups, youth becoming not only the foot soldiers, but subscribing to this major national homogenizing idea and, and identity. So I want to conclude by saying what then is the, what are the implications of this caste entrenchment and resentment, both for the societies, all our different societies, but also for the nation. Uh, what we see that uh, it would be inadequate to, to look at all this disassembling and reformation of identities without linking it to how it has contributed to religious nationalism, which is Hindutva, has both has an agenda and has an imaginary. Uh, I want to say that most recently with the Ayodhya you know, consecration of the new temple, one, all of us reflected back, some of us who meet regularly, about how in 1992, when Babri Masjid was destroyed, uh, we thought, okay, this may be the beginnings of communalism, of uh, religious nationalism as the formation of Hindu Rashtra. But we, many of us were very confident. We said, you know, caste will play a role here. Although we know caste is not a really a positive, good institution, but it is the basis of plurality. And therefore, it, people, because of different caste-based cultures, identities, nobody, especially the Dalits who formed a majority, uh, the subordinate caste, would not subscribe to Hindutva, which is a Brahminical uh, concept and idea, and endorses a Brahminical uh, social, uh, social order. And therefore, we will not see this. We were all very complacent. In 2002, Gujarat happened, the riots. And again, there is very strong evidence to show that it was the backward classes, groups, youths, including scheduled tribe groups who had ganged up uh, against the Muslims and therefore they played a very big role and were already very strong members of the RSS BJP network in that area. Again, we thought, oh, it would not spread to the rest of India. But as many of you know that over these past 22 years from 2002 to now, uh, 2024, there has been such a consolidation and homogenization of not only Hindutva has a sense of identity, has religion, has belonging, but the consensus has spread in which it is strongly linked to a political order that shifts from democracy to di dictatorship, where even the subordinate are also submitting to this majority agenda. So what we see in terms of caste is upper caste, dominant caste groups subscribing to a homogenizing agenda in which power and privilege are to be retained by them. For example, many of you may have seen the video that was circulating since yesterday where Karge in the parliament chastises the UP chief minister for saying, very blatant, openly saying, 
all the shudra and below caste must serve the brahmins, the kshatriyas, and vaisyas. And he says, why in, with, with a constitution like this can, how dare somebody say this and what, but still we know that this is, but it is an endorsement of this kind of power and privilege and endorsing not a rule of law. And this is one of the key reasons in which they also want to get rid of the constitution as it stands today. In opposite, in op not so much in opposition, but aligning with this su su subscription is a submission to of by the low subordinate caste. More, not only has political strategy, but they are being co-opted through many ways. We know, for example, how uh, the BJP and RSS have gone to sub small small groups and said, "Oh, here is your hero. We will build a statue for him or her." Here is your Purana, your, you know, your mythical ancestor we will uh, celebrate. Uh, we will give you caste-based corporations. We will give you special identities or sub-caste categorization, et cetera, or, or recognition uh, has either SCs and STs, et cetera. So what is being forged across the nation in terms of caste identity is not an identity of we, but us versus them, which we see both at the caste level and very explicitly between Hindus and Muslims, in which the other is both the Muslim and or any other religious minority. So all of these have lessons for us, and they resonate with what uh, in Turkey, Ese Temelkurun, very well-known historian, has written this fascinating book, which is called How to Lose a Country, which is about Turkey shift from democracy, from you know very social liberalism, which they've almost very westernized, to that of dictatorship. He uh, he gives many many reasons, but he says one of the key things which is very visible and which actually forms the foundation for the shift to dictatorship is how these kind of narratives craft a new citizen. This new citizen will not have a sense of belonging to a larger uh, uh, nation or to ideas, but is quite complicit and to be subordinate to an authority who resolves everyday issues. For example, we are seeing it in India where people say, oh, we got good roads, the markets are booming, we are getting good profits, uh, uh, more educational institutions have come, our children are all migrating to the West and getting good jobs, etc., but not really looking at the larger implications for erosions of democracy that are taking place. So it is there in this thing, we also see new citizens endorsing caste-based cultures within the framework of Hindutva. And where, and very clearly, Temulkran says, where immorality becomes legitimized. And I think this is very important to the extent to which we've seen in the most horrific cases. We don't see public outcry. People are not coming out. People are not decrying this, but are also accepting it as uh, you know, justified uh, punishment for transgressions, etc. And we've seen this not only in rape cases, but in corruption cases, in the incarceration of many innocent uh, human rights activists, etc. So legitimizing and accepting immorality and the abuse of rule of law is very important. So I want to conclude by saying that we, India has for now for many centuries been a hierarchical society, exclusion, differences were there, but we've also had plurality has of the fabric of our cultures, uh, the Nehruvian imaginary upheld this plurality has layered identities that you could be part of your religion, your caste, your region, but you could also and should be an inclusive citizen of the nation. But here what you have contemporaries as religious nationalism becomes the nation dominant narrative. It is abetted by caste entrenchment both into jati, subjati identities to forms of power and privilege in which both in individual violence and violence at the collective and community level and at the national level are legitimized. And therefore, I think violence has become the most common form of this form of resentment we see across the spectrum. Thank you very much for your attention. And Madam, I would like to just uh, uh, say one thing. Anthropological studies or studies in a different angle uh, needs more attention in the present scenario. And you have put up the paper in a very systematic way wherein which you have looked into subordinate caste, the concept of subordinate caste. More time you used subordinate caste than the Dalit. Because Dalit then Dalit activities got some other space. Uh, and 
another thing is disadvantaged caste group so the terminology itself is uh, something different from the uh, other narration so i like it another thing is which i would like to uh, say more studies required as madam suggested that 8 rupees or 9 rupees invariably spent for feeding a child in a education institution especially in school education needs special attention when we are implementing new education policy and we are talking much on modernity and uh, and globalization it's very relevant to think about it and another area where i would like to stress upon the dominant class is raising up and modernity is mixing with the varieties where she presented one thing that is urban centers and semi urban centers there a particular attraction is for youth their youth is getting some few of them get are getting job others are jobless and they are misused wherein which i would like to take your attention and highlight upon why this concept of modernization or modernity or globalization is not catching the attention of the subordinate class and they are getting or they are attracted we may say that dalit brahmin some of them may say or pretending that we are at par with the upper caste or upper caste ideology attracted to that we believe that when modernity comes the urban centers natural the cultural change is supposed to be evident but it is not happening that is what your paper say it's not happening rather it is threatening that cultural change is not taking place as we envisage i think so the part where in which madam explain about violence of course in media we are able to get into details but the studies in this regard especially in the higher learning centers it's a new phenomenon where i would like to take your attention madam more job sectors like uh, railways postal department and others where in which the the subordinate class were attracted much so one side land reforms are either hijacked or stopped other sector when you look at the sector which is supposed to attracted by the dalit or the subordinate class is corporate sector they are lightly they are getting a chance but whereas government sector they are losing not only in the higher learning centers even the normal sector where in which the the railway department where the lower level post is also neglected because job is offered now again by the corporate sector hiring a person where hiring a person chances of getting lower caste person or subordinate class is very rare that way exclusion from strengthening the economic background of the such categories of people are getting neglected this scenario creating another cultural problem also because of the financial support is also not there regional level when you uh, touched upon i am having one doubt here there are so many agencies or social reform units are working in our country part of modernization and and the colonial struggle at that time itself they have taken birth most of them still they are working in our country are they not taking up all these issues or such studies any any highlights on your side so uh, there are uh, plenty of areas where which you have made things in a in a in a very specific manner the last conclusion part also i would like to come in power and privilege are to be retained by the upper caste so they are planned they are focused and they are executing 
At the same time, what do you mean? That there should be a, a serious studies or serious uh, way of uh, bringing up them to the scenario where in which they are going to be in danger. So what way it can be? Thank you. Over to the audience for uh, keeping or giving your valuable ideas and your interaction. Session is open to all. Thank you. Only two issues that I will take up. I uh, deliberately did not uh, use uh, the term Dalits, uh, mostly because for the past decade that I have followed the Dalit movement and the identity. I find it problematic because academia incorporated it because it came from the movements and thought it's a legitimate, uh, the, the, thought it's a legitimate category, it was. But over the decades you also see that the Dalit movement is deeply fragmented and is not really representative of all. For example, the DSS Dalit Sangar Samiti of Karnataka, which was formed in the 70s, was very powerful, became very weak and actually has co-opted into the RSS BJP and has split into 12 subgroups. And only last year on December 6th, when the, uh, there is a movement against the demolition of Babri Masjid, they came together because we were getting ready for the elections uh, in 2023. Uh, so, and they are there is a problem of representativity. Are they representative as a political or a movement of all the people? So for us, at least for me, the idea of subordinated castes, I draw on from the writer Devanur Mahadeva, the well-known Kannada writer who many of you know has written this very important small booklet on the RSS. Uh, and earlier he had said that all these castes should be called talapai, Talapai Samudayagalu, that means the foundational caste. He says, let us get rid of all these other things. We are the foundational caste. And, but subordination has been our most historical experience. So I had just tried to draw on that and therefore why I call them subordinate caste. Uh, you're right also about modernity and uh, sub it's, it's very, very complex and I didn't explicate that enough. Um, see, modernity typically shouldn't be um, what is seen most popularly in not only in our country, but elsewhere it's associated with westernized standards of living. But modernity should be about a set of ideas which endorses and upholds uh, values of freedom, of liberty, of rights, of uh, you know human dignity, of fraternity, etc. But you don't see that. Many people think they are modern because they have you know the most uh, recent car, or the children are dressing, but, or have English education, etc., which is very superficial. So it is not, modernity is equated to consumerism and uh, lifestyle, and is not really a set of values for which you stand and which you practice. That is why we are seeing this huge contradiction where the upper class, now they're really the transnational upper classes in urban metropolitan India, whose lifestyle, in fact, many of our international visitors are shocked by the standards of living of these people. Uh, somebody who came uh, from Cambridge last time to one of the science institutions in India and visited someone, he was shocked. He was said, of course, I'm happy that these standards are so good and all this is available, but I know it is restricted to things. He said, this compares their lifestyle, for example, what are called the new smart homes in outside Bangalore that cost an average of five crores, which are completely run by high technology. You know, you press a button, windows open, everything is done by automation, etc. This is a person was commenting and saying, uh, these are the very same people who without batting an eyelid will say, you know, I have to go and perform this, this ritual in my village because uh, for example, take the South Canada Brahmins, the Konkani people, are very, very uh, in the forefront of cutting-edge technology, investments, uh, everything, you name it, and professionalism. Bhuta Aradhya, it is the devil, the, what, it's not called the devil, but the small deity worship is being revived very strongly by them. Without recognizing that these were rituals done in an agrarian context in which many caste groups came and there was a ritual in which you actually propitiated the, la the land first and then you had the Kambla or the buffalo races. Kambla was brought to Bangalore last year at tremendous ecological cost. Some of us objected, we said they spent more than some 40-50 lakhs to make the paddy fields in the palace grounds and had buffaloes transported by 
these vans, these big, big trucks from South Canada, and they had the buffalo races in Bangalore. Can you imagine? So a repro what I talked about was the reproduction of rituals in a decontextualized way in which uh, it is a reinforcement of your caste regional identities rather than a subscription of modernity. In, in fact, a pure ecological sense should have told people, don't do this. In fact, people who work for this prevention of cruelty to animals, I was telling someone, you go and file a case. You, you torture these poor buffaloes by tying them up for almost 24 hours in trucks and bringing them all the way, etc. So you see, it is a violation of rights, it's a insensitivity, but completely the amount of arrogance that you see there, combining big wealth with high ritual power and, and social status. So this is why I think modernity has set of ideas as being defied by some of these caste groups, including lower caste for whom, you know, we see it in the villages way. We see boys who become very cocky only because they have motorbikes and, you know, smartphones, etc., but who, who really know nothing else. Uh, so it has very superficial, has, has uh, lifestyles, that is what I was trying to say. Thank you. The last several centuries, the lower caste, they have been suffering from the social exclusion and discrimination. Why there was no resistance from this depressed class so far? See, they were uh, subordinating themselves to the upper ideology of the Brahminical, Brahminism. But at the same time, what I, uh, I mean, my knowledge is limited, but what I understand is that the Brahminical domination is the one which creates the distinction between the caste. Hierarchical uh, distinction is meant by that. And as an ideological apparatus for the same, Mahabharata, Ramayana and the epics are being used. This was, not this was not accessible to the lower caste. Then how come this ideological domination of the upper caste comes to the lower caste and why there was no resistance from the lower caste? It's one thing. And secondly, Madam was uh, telling that giving access to the, uh, giving access, legitimate access to the wealth and the resources of the country is one of the methods in which class discrimination can be eliminated or rather it can be reduced. But in Kerala what we experience is that despite the Land Reforms Act has come into existence but still the, the distinction prevails. So what actually is the remedy, remedial measure or uh, your suggestions to that effect? This is another one. So but merely by giving access to the legitimate access to the wealth and the resources of the country will not be a sufficient for annihilation of this caste. So what is required is, is it the reformation in the caste system is what is needed or the annihilation of the caste system as what is visualized by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Good morning ma'am. Very good speech anyway. I just want to say that I have been working in Saudi Arabia for many times. There also we can see even that is dominated by Muslim country but there are caste system like that there also like uh, black Arabies and all, okay? They are just uh, uh, just eliminated from other part, other Arabies and all. But even the government is doing many things for them. They are providing uh, food and also job for them. And they are caring them. But now our country, India, such a leaders we had, Gandhiji, Nehru and all, okay? So they were against and also many of them. Not, not like Saudi Arabia and all other countries, we had all such good brains. And they were trying to eliminate all these caste systems and many, every area, like in each state, even in Kerala also, many other. But even now also we can see, I worked in uh, Panamaram, you know, Vayanad. There are Adivasi children over there. And we went to their house and all, very small, small houses. And government built them big, big houses, but they are not ready like that. So their mind is like this. And some of them are, these children are exploited, especially girls. They were exploited by people. And like that, that part itself, even now also very low condition. So my, uh, I have one suggestion like that. Psychologically is itself, their mind should be changed. Otherwise, how they will improve? Whatever we did for these type of people, they are not changing. So. What is the reason I am also thinking what to do for them? By educationally or psychological level, we have to do something in education so that the people, those who are, who are living in our country, their mind will change and they had a tendency 
some of the children had a tendency, that means those who are in upper level, they have a tendency to, they are our some, same like us. Humanity should be, that means prohibit, that means that should be, uh, uh, we have to just uh, uh, proclaim that part we should do in education or psychological level and those who are like ma'am, the people, those who are uh, doing that, that also we stress then we can make them also to our level. Just a suggestion. Thank you so much. The question should be brief. That is a warning. So, I, there is no marriage laws for tribals. So, so no legal disposable right. Would you like to enlighten me by making any suggestion in a way of solution? No marriage, no marriage laws for tribals. There is no legal right over the land where they are living. No disposable right. I want to say they have been, I mean, literature looks at both the bhakti movement le between 11th and 12th century as one of the main forms of resistance. But again, all of those were co-opted, but they may not have been significant. Uh, this is something that I have also been uh, discussing with people where now in the context of communalism, you know, the, all the bhakti saints, their sayings of inclusion, of integration, questioning, caste is always invoked. Kabir, for example, uh, Baswa, Baswarna in Karnataka, all the related Veera Shaiva saints, etc. are being uh, invoked. Uh, one thing is, I think it was the lack of adequate res resistance across history, especially mo in the modern, say, um, I mean, from the 19th century onwards, meant that was the reason that Am Ambedkar converted to Buddhism, to saying that within Hinduism and in the modern nation state, I don't see ways in which caste could be annihilated. And you're right, I would also say that it's uh, caste can never be reformed. You ca there is no to keep even elements of caste, of the caste system as we know, it would be very, very inadequate, very deeply problematic. It has to be annihilated. We have to conceptualize some ways in which integrated societies, in which all the, what are called the principles of caste, the hereditary occupation, separation, exclusion, rules of endogamy where you have to marry within, all of those have to be questioned very substantially. But uh, you're also right in the sense that uh, this lack of resistance, adequate, prolonged, and foundational resistance is one of the uh, challenges we face. That is why when I said, when I explained why I didn't use the whole uh, Dalit terminology and DSS, I find that again, uh, it is very deeply problematic. Politically, they are very problematic, and uh, therefore also limited in, in the form of resistance they are putting up with. Uh, thank you for these comments, especially uh, uh, linking Saudi Arabia, the changes to India, what is happening, and uh, to your comments as, um, about uh, Adiva in the Vainad thing. I think one needs to be very careful because many of us tend to see uh, different forms of living uh, which is very different from the mainstream as inadequate that people like Adivashi, should, if they're given benefits, they should just imitate us, uh, get educated, live in proper homes, you know, have proper jobs, etc. I think it's very deeply problematic uh, because what we know is not just for India, but across the world, the, there are three types of crises, I think, in the world, which is the crisis of extreme inequalities, which shows is a crisis of capitalism that no longer has capitalism as a system viable. It's linked to the crisis of democracy that is spread across the world where you're seeing, it's very strongly linked to the rise of dictatorship and climate change, uh, which is devastating, which is really a, a result of what capitalism has done to nature and to the kind of societies it has generated in which consumerism and excessive extraction of nature is the problem. So in that context, we have societies which are more nature-based. It's not to romanticize the Adivasis, but whose lifestyle tells us that it is much more sustainable. So I think that cr criteria of sustainability, of democracy, of longevity, you know, over generations should really be used. And across, for example, uh, the real strength, I know, you know it's not reported in the mainstream media, the very positive movements in North America, both Canada and in the US, are the indigenous people's rights, who are now saying, okay, for 500, to 500 odd years, you've imposed 
a political, economic, social system on us. This is what it has done. But we will now reclaim our land. We will reclaim our ways of living. Our languages are being revived. And we want to have better human nature relationships. So I think we need to be very careful and question the dominant system in very significantly. I didn't understand fully this question of tribals. I think that you're right, there is no legal right, both SCs and STs. If, if there is land that has been allotted to them, they don't have legal right to sale. So there is... And to, and to SC lands in Karnataka, you cannot, SCs who were allocated land through land reform or given government land, you, nobody can buy it and that rule still holds. In some ways that was done as a way to protect them across India, for example, prohibition, because if not, outsiders would have bought the land and pauperized them even more. Uh, therefore, the non-marketization of land should be seen as actually positive, in which the trend is towards community rights of land. In fact, they, the Forest Rights Act is endowing our, uh, uh, Adivasis to actually petition the government to get both individual more land and to have community access to the forest, which I think is, is very positive. And this protective measure has to be kept in place, especially where we know in large tracts, Chhattisgarh under, when it was under Madhya Pradesh, or large tracts of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and et cetera, where the money hold, money lenders have huge, you know, entry into these Adivasi areas, taking their land, all their produce, procurement, et cetera, would mean if you open up the land market and there is no protection, all the land would shift into their hands and these people would be pauperized even more, which is why in Jharkhand there is this huge uh, movement uh, to actually have community rights over land rather than individual rights, etc. So I think we need to be cautious there also. I would like to have your take on the caste census of which we hear a lot oh, about these right. days. Yes, yeah. Thank you. If you redefine reservation, mm -hmm. it should be representation. Mm -hmm. So, some people are fearing about the inadequate representation or adequate representation or more adequate representation of upper caste or the caste dominant. Mm -hmm. So, what's your take? I have one request. Uh, you just go to the Indian history in the olden ages, you know. What are the th uh, people that time? Uh -huh. suffered in India. Mm. Huh? Yeah. So that led to this condition. So no. you have to go through Indian history first. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is my request. I endorse a caste census. I think a caste census would be very important because it will tell us the realities of both standards of living, access to resources, education, employment, etc. I think Bihar did a very good job. We already, the, the details from the Bihar caste census really tell, hi, highlight all forms of exclusions for us and give us a better picture and would lend itself to better social policy making. Uh, at the same time, I, I think uh, the caste census, in, in, in fact, may not be as it is, in, at least from what we've got a little bit of thing. In fact, it can even go beyond these basic parameters and can even document forms of violence at many, many levels. So I endorse it and it must be done by all the states uh, with, with great... Karnataka has done it, but again, politically, they're not releasing it, which I think... Yes, yes. And which many of us have been pressing the government, saying that you must release the census. It's very important. So I endorse that. Uh, this Article 64, I'm not too sure what exactly you mean, who's asking for more representation, and I'm not familiar with it. Uh, uh, so, hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not... Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is, I think, across the country, in each state, uh, people are mobilizing for better representation, which is even within subjatis, this, this splitting what are called internal reservations, that you increase the quota within each caste. I think that, again, needs to be de debated. I don't have details for Kerala. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very much. I endorse that. And one of the things we've been talking about democracy in this new campaigns is democracy is not just a political issue. It is not just li limited to electoral politics. Democracy should really be a culture which seeps into the society and also defines interpersonal relationships. Uh, but I think in that context, representativity is very important and this needs to be reviewed very critically. It's also how the most marginalized in many cases have been left out because they've not lobbied to be on the list, which we're seeing across the country. And also reclassification. Some want to move from SC to ST and STs want to move to SC. That, that kind of debate is also taking place. The final comment about history, uh, I don't think I understood it fully because I think I tried to draw on history, but maybe it was inadequate. There may, be, may have been patches. Uh, but to me, an, un, uh, an anthropological understanding would be inadequate without really good history. Uh, and therefore, we've tried to look at some historical facts and trends. Thank you. I was uh, telling Professor Sudhakaran and DD yesterday that one of the ways we continue to work on these issues is only because we have a sense of hope. And uh, the main media is not reporting it. There are many forms, not of this kind of resistance against caste, but I think the resistance against yeah, religious nationalism is picking up momentum. I, since it was not directly related to this topic, I didn't highlight it. Small ways, uh, very underlying ways, resistance is forging. Although I said modernity is not a mindset, but I think complete subordination to this is not going to happen. And it is through discussion such as this that we all need to come together and forge ways to form not only resistance, but also alternatives. One of the reasons that there is subscription to this is many people say, what is the alternative to this political To forging why I deliberately elaborated on critiquing mainstream societies and looking for alternatives, not the dominant, that subordinate groups should not subscribe to the dominant because what we have as dominant of which we are all a part of is so deeply problematic. It's a complete crisis internationally that we're seeing. So therefore, to articulate, to work out, to implement the alternative is something that we should work on. And therefore, that should be uh, to go with hopes to do that. Idea of religion mm -hmm. as an agent of liberation mm -hmm. or bondage, particularly, particularly with reference to your area, that is the inclusion of the subordinate classes into the Lingayat mm -hmm. sections, mm -hmm. I mean the Veera Shaiva mm -hmm. moment. Uh, this is from the education point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so the crest model which could yeah. be, you mm -hmm. know, repeated uh, in many ways because I feel that that's a lot of psychological fear in um, trying to, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, come forward and uh, do things which would help empower themselves. So that psychological and the, uh, the fact that many of the disadvantaged communities do not have high aspirational levels uh, mm -hmm. because when you interact with the students, you find that uh, what do you want to be five years hence where do you see so with a government job mm -hmm. you know some some where the ambition is not there mm -hmm. so the um, uh, how the aspirational levels can be uh, you know uh, looked at you know made higher or whatever and um, how education in that sense um, because when you look at students even the those from the disadvantaged community some of them have had the privilege of good education mm -hmm. and they go forward yeah. and we find in crest also re to just today mm -hmm. i was reading about Shah mohan and how he is you know edinburgh and he is i don't know if you remember crest student so mm -hmm. he is doing really well uh, mm -hmm. researching and now he's uh, um, taken up a job in some government uh, association and also um, that bonding, community bonding, that could help uh, to uh, bring up others, uh, you know, along the same level into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. How many of them do that? Or, you know, it's just part of modernity. You want to elevate yourself. You don't mm -hmm. want to attain a certain status, but then you don't think about mm -hmm. the community, the people uh, yeah. whom, you, where, which you are part of, um, who, whether we could do it. So, you know, build up that sort of, uh, uh, community feeling which would help or benefit the others who are less privileged, who have had less um, um, pri privileged education and they're not able to 
move forward in life because of that. And the element of psychological fear I've always noticed among these students who have not been empowered educationally, uh, culturally, etc. So there are these are the many things we can look into from the education, since you're also interested in education, from the education point of view. Uh, maybe legisl through legislation, whatever, because whatever we have now is not enough. As you said, there is a culture of resentment mm -hmm. towards uh, these people because they have reservation and so, you know, I've seen it all, you know, I've seen many people talk about it, you know, they have reservation, they're getting better jobs, yeah. we are not, etc. So, mm -hmm. all these things which could, uh, I, I don't know how, but uh, you know these are things which can be looked into at the yeah. grassroots level and uh, yeah. something could be done about it probably. Yes. I've uh, not thought about this completely, but I don't know, maybe it's my own uh, orientation and very personal stance is I see religion as a liberation, uh, as not really fully satisfactory uh, that uh, at least from the history of religions we know that they also become sectarian, they consolidate into you know monolithic institutions and ideas uh, so I'm not sure how much of that would be possible at the same time I won't say that absolute uh, some kind of uh, we know from the Russian history how after so many years of Soviet uh, denial of religion once the Soviet Union colla collapsed most people wanted to get back to religion and spiritualism which accounts for why the Russian Orthodox Church has become so powerful in the post-Soviet uh, Union phase. So I'm not really sure where I, what it is objectively about religion, what potential it has, has both uh, liberation. So I need to think about that. And um, Anita, yeah, thanks a lot for all your comments. I endorse everything that you've said, that education per se can't just be about endowment of uh, intellectual capabilities, that it has to be grounded, especially for disadvantaged castes, in recognizing themselves, their own capabilities, overcoming their you know fears, uh, their deep sense of insecurity and inadequacy that they feel, and which is what I know Crest has done so well. But it's also small alternative schools, endeavors like ours also. For example, we focus primarily first on personal growth, ability to speak, to to, you know, to engage with others, to have, be confident, to have a sense of voice, and to have a sense of agency first. That knowledge accruement comes actually secondary to that. That if you just do transfer of knowledge, it doesn't really work that adequately. So you're very right, and this is what I think uh, really a comprehensive education system should be doing rather than just transfer of knowledge or uh, what literally now it's transfer of information, not even knowledge. So. I, I would endorse all that you said. Thank you for that. Today's chief guest, Professor Va Dr. Vasavi, uh, Professor Sudhagarin, sir, my dear friends from Samarin's Guruvarman College, uh, colleagues, and to all my friends. At the very outset, I must tell you that I must express my gratitude to Professor Sudhagarin by forming such an academic platform to meet such excellent professors and have and we are having uh, so many lectures um, I'm so happy to see Dr. Vasavi here after about 20 years that is in 2004 uh, I met her at CDS when she came there to uh, as a part uh, came there as a part of forming crust in Kori code Professor D.D. was also there. And after that, I saw her. Today only, we have no contacts. So today morning, when I went to her room to see her with much assistance, thinking that she may be uh, forgot. But immediately seeing me, she even recognized, she recognized me with my name. So I am surprised to see that. Besides, Professor Sudhagarin was telling, this is the Vasanthi you were asking. Again, I was shocked. So, you are a true social observer, ma'am. So, uh, till this date, we had six lectures. This is the seventh one. And this is a, a, an enlightening lecture which forms as an eye opener. This needs much, as you told, ma'am. We have to be careful and deal, uh, careful to see such subjects and uh, 
work with much caution because uh, when you say the adivasi group in my exp experience of people of ayanad area that is near pakam they the people the natives of native children of that area told me once if somebody call us adivasi we will beat them so they never like that term to call them adivasi and they told me teacher you can call us adivasi but i never did that so in my observation in that area i can i could see that they are not adivasis sometimes the people outside that uh, area may be adivasis because the people i met they observed so many systems with uh, much purity that is in the caste entrench in the when saying caste entrenchment they observe some systems which they never deviate for example one example uh, that is there is an uh, uh, source you may be uh, all of them all of you may be uh, seeing in youtube kani that is a source of water and uh, that is a small area and in one side they take water for cooking and all and there is a special space to take water for their puja systems they never change that so 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 many examples i could see that so they uh, there are people they never like uh, to call them adivasis when we come to the uh, outside world the subordinate groups and caste groups different caste groups people uh, never want to deviate with their uh, though there are inter caste marriages they never people never want to deviate from their caste identity as a group because recently one student told me um, uh, teacher we met to met and thought that is here is a temple in kolkod and uh, we were thinking that we must unite outside the caste group because that temple is dedicated to one caste group so we want to form uh, to invite to unite all other people of this area except to the upper caste because upper caste never come but when he put the idea in the committee the people never want so that is uh, um, that uh, such examples are a lot so anyway today we have we had a good lecture and i open up ma'am uh, on caste entrenchment uh, violence resen resentment and violence and uh, which needs a, which forms as an i opener and other speciality of this today is that till this uh, day we had many discussions many talks but today's talk is accepted by the audience with much discussions so that is a great achievement of this lecture and i hope i believe that is because of your lecture man the topic and the excellent uh, lecture uh, you chose to um, and we are lucky we we are lucky to have such a an intelligent uh, very relevant topic and uh, the discussions are uh very nice so first of all i must thank uh, dr vasavi for coming here with all her uh, with all her without uh, taking with uh, much uh, difficulties she came here and presented a nice lecture on caste resentment and in and the relevance of that in contemporary india with uh, a document evidence i thank my on behalf of the serena trust trust and the all members who are uh, who met here i thank you ma'am then i thank professor sudagaran who is responsible for bringing all of us to be here and i thank all, everybody who are here thank you thank you